with this talk, I thought I'd just go back to what we found last time, which was the uh, patheneural ground state method. And, and we used, for the, at least for the harmonic oscillator and the dumbest wave function possible, right, we got this expression, which was the potential energy as a function of imaginary time. But the sort of physical time slice where we're going to sample the ground state wave function was right here. Um, and you, know, you can see that it converges very quickly. And the systematic bias that would have been there if we had done something like a variational Monte Carlo is essentially absent, or it can be projected out over these time slices. And then I said, aha, let me show you how good things work if we use a good uh, wave function. But then, of course, I had the wrong variational parameter. So I've, I've changed that. So the, the correct variational parameter in this wave function is something like square root of pi over 2. And so when one uses that, you can see that you essentially get the right answer immediately. Um, let's see here. So it basically oscillates around the exact value. And right here, we get something within error bars. And this is with you know, 10,000 Monte Carlo steps. So the idea is that if you have a good guess of a wave function, which in many cases we can use our physical intuition to get, um, this, this is an extremely powerful method. It can allow you to study very large system sizes, up to the caveat that you need bosonic degrees of freedom because of the sign problem. OK, so now I'm going to show you how you can actually use these methods to calculate some, some cool stuff, entanglement in various systems. And this is work that's been, you know, I'm going to talk about work over the last five years or so um, with various collaborators and my postdoc and, and students at, uh, at UVM and former postdoc and some excellent collaborators. OK, so I think so far in this, uh, you know, up until now, We've seen that entanglement is really some language to understand all of these different things, right? So we can somehow unify emergent space-time, quantum matter, and quantum technologies. And maybe we haven't seen so much, uh, you know, except for a few talks on the quantum technology side of things. And I'm going to give you my perspective, which is how do we put these two things together? Maybe how can we extract or measure the amount of entanglement in quantum matter? And how could we maybe use that in, in some quantum technologies? And in particular, I'm going to focus on, on quantum liquids and gases. And this is sort of maybe a, a niche topic a little bit, just because a lot of the theory, mostly because it's easier and you can do exact diagonalization, um, has focused on systems with discrete Hilbert spaces and local degrees of freedom. So this would be things like you know, localized qubits or insulating lattice models, a lot of the stuff that uh, Roger Melko talked about. Um, but a lot of experiments, especially in the, the cold atoms side of things, um, and, and ions, the positional states of, of ions, as we saw Rajiv will talk about, um, can employ sort of the itinerant positional state. So the, the main theme of this talk is going to be understanding how, if I have identical quantum particles and they can move either in space or on a lattice, what kind of, you know, what does that bring to the table in terms of entanglement? And I'm going to come full circle at the end and go back to helium, which is sort of this, you know, the, the paradigm quantum liquid. And can we determine how much entanglement there is in helium? And as I said, the interest for me is that this is a macroscopic quantum wave function that can be easily prepared in, in a lab. Um, you know, just, just have to cool, cool some helium down. And these are just some examples. We've already actually seen some of these examples cited before. In particular, Rajivol was talking about um, ions and also his neutral lattice gases, where you can actually measure entanglement entropy. And so we're going to basically ask and then try to answer three questions. The first is going to be you know, one of the, the most important things. And again, we heard this talked about already that is very fundamental in quantum mechanics is that if I have two rubidium atoms, they're identical. right? So how does indistinguishability, that's a hard one for me to say, um, affect entanglement and particular you know, particle statistics, bosonic versus fermion, fermionic statistics? So that's one of the questions we're going to try to answer. Um, the other one is can we actually use the entanglement in quantum fluids as a resource for information processing? Uh, and it's actually a rather subtle question. One has to really distinguish between you know, how entangled a state is and is that entanglement useful? Can you extract it and transfer it to a register? That's how we'd actually do quantum information processing. And then the last one, which we've actually already heard a lot about, is how does entanglement scale with the size of the subregion? Right. So we've heard a lot about area laws. If I have some system that's growing, in particular if it's a, you know, the ground state of a gapped Hamiltonian, um, then we expect potentially that the, you know, the entanglement between region A and its complement here doesn't behave as a generic state in the Hilbert space would a volume law, um, but something like a boundary or an area law in, in three dimensions, so that it scales with the size of the subsystem to the d minus one. So can we, you know, there's a, there's a proof for this for gap states in one dimension. Um, there's corrections for conformal field theories. Can we actually search for this area law in a real quantum state of matter, the ground state of, of superfluid helium? So those are the three things that I'm hoping to address. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start by just really kind of 
rebooting and, and talking about these subtleties and what makes entanglement in, uh, in the, you know, when I'm talking about the positional states of identical uh, many particle systems and how this might differ than the types of examples we've seen before, which is usually about, as I said, localized degrees of freedom or maybe looking at spin singlets and things like that. Um, then I'll talk about measuring entanglement and I'm going to show you yet another proof of, of this swap algorithm that Roger and, and Rajivel talked about, an operator proof. And then in particular within this language that we learned about two days ago of these bosonic world lines within the path integral ground state method, how it's essentially trivial um, once, you know, once you have the simulation up and running, all you need to do is really copy your simulation and then add an update or an estimator inside there. And then I'll give you some results. Um, first, some, some benchmarking on, on exactly solvable models so we make sure we know what we're doing, and then some on generic uh, quantum liquids. Okay, so let's start you know, way back at the beginning. Um, and a lot of the kind of examples that I'm going to give are going to be on some toy quantum matter. So it's going to be something like a Hubbard model, or it could also be, you know, if it has hardcore interactions, you could think of it like spinless fermions. So I'm going to start with bosons with hard cores on a 1D lattice. So for the sake of some examples, let's think about four sites and two bosons. Okay, so and let's imagine these are hardcore bosons or, or free fermions. Let's say, and let's imagine also that we have periodic boundary conditions, um, so these two sites are connected. And I'm gonna imagine the simplest possible Hamiltonian here where I just have some kinetic term that measures hopping of these bosons and I have uh, next nearest neighbor repulsion, nearest neighbor repulsion, because basically I can only have one boson per site. All right, so this is nice because the Hilbert space in this example is small enough that we can really learn something about what's going on just by asking what makes this different than uh, you know, looking at the, the example that Roger went through, which was basically two spins. And there's some additional flavors here um, that are going to turn out to be interesting. Um, so we can investigate the properties, the, the entanglement or the, the quantum ground state as we change this interaction V. Um, and we basically already know what's going to happen. Right? This is kind of the, the first or at least one of the first many body models that, that I understood or, or looked at a lot. If we have very large interactions, large repulsion, um, then this thing is basically going to behave classically and we're going to get something like a solid. And I, you know, the, I basically su massively suppress the kinetic part of the energy and there's two possible states here. Um, so in, you know, in the thermodynamic limit, I would select one of these two, but for a finite size system, I'm going to get one or the other. So these are the, the total possible states in this limit. This is like a solid or a charge density wave. Um, however you want to think about it, and one can write down its, its wave function in the following way. And so I'm going to move back and forth between different ways of labeling. Uh, again, this is a subtlety of indistinguishable particles, but right now I'm basically just counting the number of particles per site. So one means one particle on the first site, zero, zero particles on, on the second site. And so in principle, one could construct a ground state wave function out of a, just a, a coherent superposition of these two solid states. So this thing just flashing back and forth. And then if I'm in the opposite limit, then this thing is like a superfluid, so I no longer pay a cost for having uh, particle fluctuations or particles near each other. And so in principle, you could think of this, so there's six possible states now, and because of periodic boundary conditions, it's not a purely equal superposition um, in this limit, uh, but basically I have something where I'm going to represent a superfluid. These things are hopping all around, and, and this would be the, the ground state. Okay, so here's my starting point, and I basically want to ask, okay, now I understand something about the solid, I can write down its ground state, and here's the, the superfluid, and I want to ask something about entanglement in these two systems. Right, and we already saw that Rajivel was actually able to measure the entanglement in such a system. They're soft core bosons, um, but uh, we basically expect that the entanglement should be large in the superfluid phase and small in this, this insulating phase, potentially. Okay, but let's ask kind of a, a deep question about what entanglement is actually telling us um, that's you know, maybe interesting to think about. So what I want to do is I want to think about these states. I'm going to break the system up. I'm going to do a spatial bipartition. As we'll see shortly, this is not the only way I could break up my system for this particular case. Um, but we're going to break it into two parts. And let's say I make a local measurement on this A complement. So I measure, make a measurement right here, and I know what this thing is. All right, so let's say I, I measure this. So I, I have a particle that's in the leftmost slot of this foresight lattice. So then I can really look. So you know, again, I'm trying to learn here what does it mean to be entangled in this system. So in this, uh, this strongly repulsive limit where I have basically just these two possible states, if I measure this in A bar, then that immediately says, OK, I know what my state on the left must be. Right? So even though naively I can form this, this ground state as this, this superposition, once I make this measurement, I know everything about the left-hand side. So I know everything about A. It can only be this state. I have no uncertainty, complete knowledge. So you know, I'm trying to get you to think about entanglement in these systems in terms of uncertainty or what you can learn by actually doing a measurement. And that's kind of the origin of the, the Shannon information entropy that we use to calculate the, the von Neumann entropy. 
But of course, this is drastically different in this other limit in the superfluid regime where we have all of these different states. So here I make a measurement on a complement and I find the state, but now you'll see that this shows up twice, right? So if I do this measurement, well, there's still some in uncertainty about what's going on in A, and so I have some incomplete knowledge on, on the left-hand side. I need to do another measurement to learn more. So there's something fundamentally different about these states in terms of this information quantity. Right? I need to do a second experiment to distinguish between these two states. So I have incomplete knowledge about the, about the left-hand side here. Okay, so then in kind of big picture, the way that I'm going to think about entanglement in this talk is it's quantum information that's encoded non-locally, right? So it's, it's encoded in this, this uh, joint state of the system. And then one can certainly ask questions about can it be quantified? So we've seen various ways of doing that, the von Neumann entropy, the, the, the Rainey entanglement entropy, mutual information, right? There's all kinds of other ones that we haven't even seen at this school yet. There's a, a whole host of them. Some have different properties. Um, that are, are better or worse for, for different situations. I'm going to mostly focus on pure states. And then can it be measured? And by this I mean measured on a, a classical computer, measured in a quantum simulator, and what would be the most efficient way to do that? And so in terms of how we might want to quantify it, again, this is kind of the way that I put these ideas together in my own head. So I know about thermodynamic entropy as just a measure of encoded information, right? So you know, if you think about just the, the, the Gibbs entropy or something, it tells me about how the access to the, the number of microstates, it's how much information I could encode. Um, entanglement is somehow some non-locally encoded quantum information. And so putting them together, this entanglement entropy, I'm just summing them up, is just a measure of entanglement. Right? So this is my naive way of thinking. And so in terms of, we've seen these formulas before, but just to motivate where they've come from. So if we start with this usual Shannon information entropy, which just weights, you know, I have some, some set of possible outcomes, um, and I want to know how much I can learn by doing an experiment in that system, what's the, the uncertainty encoded, then I just do my usual thing where I encode my probabilities in this, this reduced density matrix, which we've seen many times, where the reduced density matrix um, is just the, you know, the density matrix of some, in this case so far, spatial subregion, some bipartition of my system, where I've thrown away or integrated out everything else away. So how much can I learn about A not thinking about B? Right? Okay, so again, in this particular case, for a pure state, I would say that this particular version here has, has entanglement zero, and this one has non-zero entanglement, and so this S is just a measure. It's, it's a scalar measure. And as I said, there are many different ways we could do this. We could look at the full reduced density matrix and ask, is it mixed or pure? Right? This is something that's completely foreign in classical mechanics. Um, the fact that in quantum mechanics, even if we can specify the complete pure state of the system, we don't have complete knowledge of the subsystem. Right? Classically, if I encode, I tell you about the locations of n particles, then certainly I know everything about some subset of that system. But quantum mechanically, that's just not true. The subsystem could be mixed. Right? So that's, that's a rather impressive feature. Um, and it turns out that, in particular, this von Neumann uh, entropy could be difficult to measure in, in various cases in experiments. And so as we've seen already, um, the, the Rainy entropies, which is sort of another class of, of entropies that behave, for the most part, similar. Um, and they obey some uh, nice relationships. Um, these Rainy entropies simplify in this limit of the Rainy index, which I'll use alpha here. I think uh, Roger used n going to 1, just reproduces uh, the usual von Neumann entropy. And they have this nice relation where basically they're monotonically decreasing with the Rainy index. So S1 is greater than S2 is greater than S3. And as Roger showed us, and we heard about from, from Israel, that they obey this nice relation that they're equal for the maximally and, and minimally entangled um, state. OK. So now to our first question. So how does quantum indistinguishability affect entanglement? So this is, again, something that we haven't seen so far uh, kind of directly in terms of, I think Israel mentioned that uh, you know, we often think in condensed matter about spatial bipartitions. So we have a quantum system. We want to break it up into pieces. And so we just select some subregion of space and call that region A. Um, and then call everything else B, or I've called it A complement here. So here, imagine I have some, some gas of particles, and I just select a sphere inside, and I say all these are A. But immediately, you can see that there's something potentially different about itinerant particles, because now particles can actually fluctuate across the system. Right? That wouldn't be the same in a lattice model, where I just have spins that are fixed on some lattice sites. 
Um, and there's very, so this type of spatial bipartition is just one of a whole set of different types of bipartitions that we could call mode bipartitions, right? So Duncan talked about, uh, you know, cuts um, in essentially momentum space. Uh, you could have, you know, any, any types of single particle modes that you can imagine. You could imagine just breaking up, uh, you know, your system into some local mode occupations, which I've denoted by N here, N in A and N in A prime. So this is, would be spatial modes, and my reduced density matrix is just uh, gives me this, this entanglement entropy through whatever formula I choose to use. So this is really the kind of more natural one. And so, but if someone tells you that a system is, is highly entangled, or I give you a ground state, and I say I have a highly entangled ground state, well then, especially if you have you know, identical particles and, and itinerant particles, a natural question would be to ask, well, which, which modes do you mean? It's not enough to just say a system's highly entangled. I need to know which modes it's entangled under. Or for the ca this particular case, where things move around and they're indistinguishable, there's also sort of a very different type of bipartition that one could do which is a bipartition in particle numbers. So we call this particle partition entanglement or particle entanglement. So I have my gas and I just arbitrarily pull out some subset n, little n of them, and then the bipartition is between little n and the complement. And this makes sense in the case where I have a fixed total number of particles. And you'll see this idea come back again and again, this idea of a super selection rule that the total number of particles is fixed. Uh, here, one of the maybe nice things about this is that the reduced density matrix is a, a quantity that we're very familiar with in condensed matter, right? So the reduced density matrix in this particular case, all it means is I have to integrate the p positions of the capital N minus little n other particles, and this is just the n-body reduced density matrix. So it's something that we know how to calculate, that we work with, it's known in, in various models, and in particular for the kind of simplest bipartition that you can imagine here, which is little n equals one, so one particle with the rest, then row one we know a lot about, the one-body reduced density matrix, and in particular for a, a bosonic system, um, we know how it gives us things that can be measured in experiments, um, for example, the, the condensate fraction, right? So the, the, one, the, the long distance tail of the, the one-body density matrix gives us some information about the number of particles, bosonic particles that are, that are in the condensate. And you know, the, the one could go on, one could think about, so in particular for the condensate, which is along the lines of this modes, one could ask, for example, in a, uh, in a BC, um, if I turn on interactions, then I can depopulate the, the condensate from, from one, right? So the condensate fraction is in one. So you could ask something like, how entangled is the condensate with the depletion of the condensate? And there's all kinds of games you could play. Um, and, and the idea would hopefully be that this could tell you something about the role of, of particle indistinguishability, which is where, really where this particle entanglement or one of the places this is coming from um, would give you. And also it turns out that, that particle entanglement is going to be uh, sensitive to statistics in a very different way than the, the mode bipartitions and also very sensitive to interactions in a way that, that spatial bipartitions are not. Um, one thing that, that I kind of like to think is that these give very different lengths, di different information on the same problem that could be quite complementary. So here, naturally, we're imposing some type of length scale on the problem when we do the measurement. Right? We're saying that this is the size of the spatial subregion. So we're putting a length scale into the system. But this particle by partition, there's no natural length scale. So the length scales that come out of any measurement of particle uh, by partition entanglement might tell us something fundamental about the phase or the state of the system, right? There's no imposed external length scale. Whatever length scale comes out is some property of the system in that phase. Okay, so we're gonna basically go through examples of, of both of these two types of entanglement and see where they lead us. And I'm gonna relax that hardcore constraint because it allows me to work with a little simpler Hilbert space. And also this Bose-Hubbard model is what uh, Rajivel was able to study um, in, in neutral rubidium atoms. And so this is basically the same model as before, except now I allow multiple occupation. And so I throw out the, the next neighbor interactions or the nearest neighbor interactions. And now I pay some energy costs if I have more than one boson on a site. Right? And so we understand this model. There's a phase transition at some value of U over J between a superfluid and an insulator. And so here the particles are localized, here they're, they're fluctuating, but now we just relax that constraint of one particle per site. So let's go through simple examples. Um, the first one is, LA, so two sites and two particles. And so I'm gonna do a spatial bipartition, so I call my left site A, and then the right site is the complement here. And so this is sort of the most general wave function that I could write. And so you can see I can easily interpolate between these two superfluid and insulator phases by just changing these parameters around. So let's say they're all equal to each other, the equal superposition is gonna be something like a superfluid. And if, let's say, uh, you know, this one right here is one and these are zero, then I would have some insulating phase. Where here, again, I'm counting number of particles per site. Two in A, zero in A complement, and so on. 
Okay, so we've seen a lot about you know, writing down this reduced density matrix, but given some state, how do I actually calculate it? So you calculate it exactly the way that you write it. So I wanna, if I want to calculate the reduced density matrix of the subregion A, I just need to trace out all degrees of freedom in A complement. So actually, what does that mean? Well, all degrees of freedom in A complement in this case are there could be zero particles, one particles, or two particles in this region, right? And so I just need to sum over all those possibilities with this, with this full density matrix. And when I do that, I get this, this diagonal reduced density matrix. And so you can immediately see for the case where two of these are zero and uh, one of them is unity, then this thing is just pure again, and so I'd have zero entanglement. So that immediately comes up from, from this. But if I have you know, alpha, beta, and gamma non-zero and, and equal to each other, um, then this thing is gonna be potentially mixed and I'm gonna have some entanglement. And in this diagonal form, it's trivial to write down, for example, the von Neumann entropy, and I can just expand it out like this. Okay, so this is probably an example that you're familiar with or you've maybe done before. Um, but what about this particle by partition entanglement? And how does it give us different information than this? So here, I'm artificially coloring one of these bosons in this Bose-Hubbard model A and are green and the other one red or orange, right? And of course, this is an artificial coloring. This is first quantization, but we can certainly do this. I say, you know, I can keep track of this one and keep track of this one, and then I just need to worry about making sure that the wave function encodes the particle statistics, bosonic or fermionic. And so I'm gonna use a pretty messy notation. If you can think of a better one, uh, please, I'd be happy to hear about it. So basically, this notation means that I have uh, so I'm encoding the same general state, and so this is the case where I have uh, one particle on site one and uh, one particle on site two, so that's what this, this notation means. And so this is the one one, and this is the zero two part of that. Sorry, I said that backwards, that's why this notation is bad. So this means I have, uh, so particle one is on site one and particle two is on site one, right? And so here, particle one is on site one, particle two is on site two. And so now this is different because now, because I'm keeping track of the indices, I have this, what looks like a superposition here, right? Because I'm actually imagining that these particles are indistinguishable even though they're not. Um, and here's the zero two state. So yeah, I even confuse myself with my notation here. Okay, so one can do the same thing. I wanna take the reduced density matrix, or compute the reduced density matrix. Now, this is, I'm, it's a one body reduced density matrix because I only have one particle in the, in the subregion. And so now I need to essentially sum over all locations of particle two. So you can see how this trace is always just in which degrees of freedom there are in your subregion. And when I do that, I get a smaller reduced density matrix than I did before um, that clearly has off-diagonal terms here. And this could potentially tell me very different, very different information. And in fact, for general, so I can encode those alpha, beta, and gammas in terms of U over J. If I go back to my original model, this is just two particles on two sites. I can just exactly diagonalize this Hamiltonian. Um, and what I see is that the, this is the entanglement entropy as a function of interaction strength. So indeed, the spatial entanglement entropy is large in the superfluid. So that kind of tells us what we think, right? There's lots of stuff fluctuating around. We imagine that superfluid state is highly entangled and this decreases down and there's some residual amount just because of finite size effects, even in the insulating phase. But the particle entanglement has the exact opposite, right? So in the non-interacting limit, the particle entanglement is exactly zero. And that's trivial to understand why, because that's like a, a BEC. And there we know, at least in first quantization, I can write the state as a product state. So again, if someone tells you that a state's highly entangled, it's useful to ask under what bipartition. And this can give us in, uh, different types of information. And in particular, you can see that the crossing here happens pretty close to where the finite size uh, value of the critical value of U over J would be. So maybe there's information to be learned about phase transitions even here out of this spatial um, and particle entanglement. So they can give us complementary information on phases, on interactions, and on statistics. Okay, so that's spatial entanglement versus particle entanglement. So then the next question I wanted to ask is, is can we actually use the entanglement in quantum fluids as a resource for information processing? And the idea here is really that, you know, entanglement is, is a universal resource. And so if I could build a large many body system that was highly entangled, and I could somehow extract the entanglement out of it into just a standard qubit register, then those would be entangled, right? And then I could do quantum information processing utilizing the entanglement. In, in the resource, which in this case is, let's say, the BC or the superfluid or whatever it is. So that's the idea, so can we use it? Or, um, as you know, Sir Keith Burnett pointed out, is it all just fluffy bunnies? 
if you Google Fluffy Bunny image search, this is the first bunny that comes up. Um, so Fluffy Bunnies is basically a statement of, you know, is it just mathematically well-defined but not useful entanglement? So does it purely come from, let's say, symmetrization of the wave function, but it's not actually useful to do any information um, processing with? I think this is actually even in the title of this paper. Okay, so this is what I said. If I actually want to use entanglement as a resource, then I have to be able to perform local physical operations on subsystems. I need to be able to swap the entanglement from my resource into my, my quantum register. And immediately, you should argue with me that, that this particle entanglement that I've told you could give you useful information about the phase is really inaccessible in the lab due to the fact that these particles are indistinguishable. Right? So even if mathematically I can work in first quantization in an experiment, I can't you know, target particle six. Right? There's no way I can do that. Um, but actually recently there's a, there's a nice PRL that, that talks about there is a mechanism by which this particle entanglement could be transferred to some types of mode entanglement, which could then be extracted by, you know, experiments essentially target local single particle modes here. So maybe this is not completely lost. Um, but actually even the spatial, so this is the case that I just said, so if I've, uh, now let me go back to two particles on four sites. Um, so I don't know how to specify the location of X1 versus X2 right, in this. Uh, but even the spatial entanglement has problems in the sense of, of actually wanting to use it. And that's because if, as in any of these cold atom experiments, the neutral atoms that, that Radzival was talking about, when they start, they start deep in the mod insulating phase. And so they know how many particles they have on each of those sites. Uh, they start with a total fixed number of particles, and those particles don't disappear. And so they have a particle number conservation, which really gives us what's called a super selection rule here. Um, and the super selection rule, what is it actually doing? It's basically saying that you know, for physical atoms, I can't create coherent superposition states because I can't have a, you know, a, a local superposition of zero and one atoms in some region of space with the total number fixed. Right? This would be like working in a spin model at fixed magnetization. That's our super selection rule here. And this actually drastically limits the amount of useful entanglement because essentially in the spatial entanglement, all possible number fluctuations are included. Right? But if I actually want to do a measurement where I take, do a swap operation from this is my resource and I imagine this is my, my qubit register, then I essentially need to project onto the local subspace of fixed particle number when I do that measurement. And an easy way to, to see this is, so let's say I start changing my notation a little bit here to make it very clear. So let's say I start in, in the case where I have you know, one particle in A, one particle in B. So I have two particles total, or I have two in A, um, none in B, or none in A and two in B. So this is a, certainly a valid state that would be highly entangled. This is my superfluid state, right? But, and I start with that with the register, this qubit in a product state. Well, it's just in zero. And I wanna basically create a, a superposition state here. I wanna swap the entanglement in here into these. Well, you can see that basically these states just won't, I can't swap, these states live outside the subspace of this qubit, right? So all of the entanglement that's in the state necessarily can't be extracted into here, and that's because these fluctuations with two particles uh, basically can't, can't extract all that entanglement with just this local operation. So any measurement I do, because I have these additional classical correlations, if you like, that are essentially the fact that if I make a measurement in my subregion and I measure one particle, I know that there's one particle over here, that limits the amount of entanglement I can actually transfer. So this has been well understood and, and well studied, and, and Wiseman and Vaccaro actually um, propose a mechanism by which you could at least quantify um, the amount that you could extract. And they use a very long term, the entanglement of particles under a spatial mode by partition or something like that. So we've called this operational, other people have called it accessible entanglement. And it's really a way of, of saying, well, I have physical particles and I have a super selection rule. So let's combine these two ideas together. And the point is that, well, I wanna measure the entanglement entropy, the spatial entanglement entropy between region A and region B. But whenever I do a measurement, I actually have to project onto that physical Hilbert space of little n particles. So here's my measurement. Every time I do a measurement, I have some different number of particles in there because of fluctuations. And even if all possible different numbers of particles are allowed in principle, they may be very unlikely, right? So imagine I have a, you know, a free Bose gas, 10 to the 23 particles in it. There is a state that will contribute to the spatial entanglement of one particle in subregion A and 10 to the 23 minus one in A bar. And I basically need to probabilistically weight the fact that that outcome is very unlikely. Um, 
And so I can do that in the following expression. So I basically just measure the spatial entanglement entropy, as I would normally, but I just count how many particles there were when I did that measurement, right, when I did the local measurement. And I weight the entanglement entropy by how likely it is to have that number of particles in the subregion. And this is something that's very natural to do. So this row AN is just the projected to the projected reduced density matrix. And so this is why I was asking Rajabul in their experiment, can they go beyond the parity? And indeed they can. So not only do you need, you know, when you're doing any real experiment, you are projecting, you're making a measurement, you're, you're counting this number of particles. And so all you need to do is now just histogram your entanglement entropy. And so if you do that, then one can prove that this has some very nice properties. Um, and it turns out that it's really the maximal amount of entanglement in the presence of such a super selection rule, like a fixed total number of particles, that can be produced between quantum registers um, by just local operations and classical communication. And it has the nice properties that it's always less than the spatial entanglement. And that's kind of obvious by the idea that any local operation decreases entanglement. And it's also, also if it's non-zero, that means that the particle entanglement is non-zero. And the particle entanglement is really you know, very sensitive interactions, and so this is sort of a, 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 a measure of, of interactions as well. And it's easy to calculate. It's easy to calculate. Uh, well, if you can measure, let's say, S in experiment, then, and you can measure the number of particles, you can do it, and this is easy for us to calculate in path interval ground state method. OK, so can we go through the calculation for this simple system? And it turns out here that actually this simple system we studied before is not quite enough. And you'll see, well, you probably already have guessed why that is from our example. We need there to at least be as many local degrees of freedom in the subregion as there is in our qubit. So we need at least two local degrees of freedom. And so one can write this full density matrix. This is the reduced density matrix we already found. So we're just doing a spatial cut here and calculating this reduced density matrix. But now we actually need to calculate the projected reduced density matrices. And when one does that properly normalized, so these correspond, remember, to this was 0, 2, or 2, 0, 1, 1, and 0, 2. So this one's 2 in subregion A, 1 particle in subregion A, 0 particles in subregion A. And the property, properly normalized projected reduced density matrices are all pure. And that's really a, a fun, so the operational entanglement is just uh, 0 here, right? Because um, if I take the, the you know, log of this thing, I get. I get zero. So this, in particular, is, a, is a, a measure of the fact that you need at least two states in the subsystem. But it's generically true that if the spatial entanglement is large, especially for bosons, this operational entanglement, the amount that you can actually extract, is going to be less. Because you're making a local operation, and that's always going to reduce entanglement. OK, so. Uh, you know, so can we measure this in an experiment? Rajivul showed this, this same slide. I just wanted to go over again just how hard it actually is to try to measure, for example, the, the von Neumann entropy um, or even the, the Rainy entropies in the absence of, of any of these replica tricks or the swap that I'm going to talk about. So this is an example he showed where even for this very simple case, it took thousands and thousands of measurements to reconstruct the full dens reduced density matrix. But if you have this data, you can certainly calculate. You know, as you do these experiments, you just collect statistics, and then you could calculate the operational entanglement um, in, in these systems. Uh, but this doesn't scale. If I have even four particles on four sites, then I have 10,000 entries, and it takes a lot of you know, graduate student time and energy to, to make so many measurements. Um, and we saw even one that's even considerably larger than this, right, with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of measurement. So we clearly need, if we want to go to larger systems, more complicated, more interesting ground states, um, we need a better approach. And we've already seen various hints of, of what that is, and it's really going to be this so-called swap. And I like this, the swap method for various reasons. One, because you know, the, pro the progression of it was an idea that came from field theory, then into numerical methods, and then into experiment. That's not you know, usually the way that technical algorithms move, and that's really what happened here. It's, it's kind of amazing. But also because I can understand it in a very physical way of why it measures entanglement. So I'm going to go through the physical argument, and then we'll go through the, this operator proof. So, this, this replica method, which is what Roger kind of derived using pictures, let me just give you another argument for why it basically is a measure of entanglement. So imagine here's my system that I break into two spatial regions, but it could be, you know, it could be any. It could be any modes or it could be particles, whatever you want. Here's my A and A bar, A complement. So now I make a replica of the system. So I have an exact copy, and they're not interacting. They're statistically independent, right? And I consider the same by partition in this system right here. So I have A prime and A bar prime. And I want to know how entangled A is with A bar. So what I can do, what this swap does via this replica trick, is I take the degrees of freedom that are here and I stick them in here. And I take the degrees of freedom that are inside here and I stick them in here. OK, so let's imagine that this state, 
this state right here is in a product state. So there's basically no entanglement between A bar and A. Then A and A bar don't really care about each other at all, right? And these are two statistically independent configurations. And so probably A prime are a reasonably good set of degrees of freedom that could be stuck down here without really affecting anything and things would just go on, right? So if A doesn't know about A bar, if there's no non-local information encoded in the state, then I can take these degrees of freedom and very well put them in because these are reasonable degrees of freedom, right? Because this is an identical copy of the system. But if there's a lot of entanglement, if there's a lot of information encoded non-locally, then A prime certainly depends a lot on the configuration A prime complement over here. And so it's very unlikely that such a swap would give me, would be very likely, right? And because entanglement is basically a log, this log right here of trace row A squared, if this is very, you know, this thing is, is really small, then minus log of that expectation value of doing this is going to be a large number, hence lots of entanglement. So that's my hand wavy argument of, of why the swap um, is a reasonable, uh, reasonable thing to do. Here's the, the reference down here for kind of the original idea. And here's a very straightforward, I think, four-line operator proof of why this has to be the case. So ultimately what I want to calculate for this, this Rainy entropy, and again, one could do this. I've done alpha equals two here for the second Rainy entropy. You could make the same argument for alpha equals n, um, but you just have to permute all the configurations. But everything would go through in the argument wise. Okay, so here's my, here's my proof. Let's go through it carefully. So I imagine taking two copies of my system. So I have two copies of my reduced density matrix. So I've traced out A bar and A prime bar right here. So I want to calculate, ultimately I'm going to make these uh, completely identical. So I want the trace of row A squared. So that's this thing right here. So I can explicitly write that trace in the following way. So I'm just tracing over this full thing, A, A, and then I add an insertion of the identity right here. And now I say, well, the reduced density matrix can be written as a trace over the degrees of freedom in A complement in both cases. So that's what I've done here. So I've just taken this and substituted it in both of these places right here. So I have this expression. So now I have the product of these two terms. And notice the labels are important here. It's AB, A prime B, A prime B prime, A B prime. So now I look at this thing and I say, well, you know, these are the, the, this is the full density matrix of the system, and this is the full density matrix of the copy of the system. And so I can basically move these two indices right here over to the left, which I've done right here. I've just made a, a more complicated state ket index here. Um, and then this thing right here is just the, you know, this structure is just the outer product of the tensor of these two. So now I look at this, and again, the order of indices is important, A, B, A prime, B prime, a, B, A, B prime. And remember that in this case, B prime um, lives out here and A prime lives out here. Okay, so now I have this thing and I say, well, this side would look like this side if this A and A prime were just exchanged. So if I just swapped them. So I can do that by saying, well, this is equal to here where I've included the swap operator here. And again, all the swap operator does is it takes those degrees of freedom A prime and swaps them with A. So once I do that, then I can recognize this thing as a trace. Right? So I have A, B, A prime, B prime, A, B, A prime, B prime. This thing's just a trace. So I have the trace of this replicated system of the swap operator. And once you see this, you should say, well, aha, this is just the expectation value of the swap in this replicated Hilbert space. Right? So this is a four-line proof. Um, it doesn't have any pants in it, uh, like Roger's proof. Um, but it basically, it gives you the same, the same answer at the end of the day. Right? And this is nice because we know how to calculate expectation values. And this is something that I can do in a, in a physical simulation of, of you know, our pig simulation. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but the nicest thing about this is that this basically tells me that, that Rainy entropies, any Rainy entropy, uh, can be computed via local expectation values. And that's the big thing that has motivated all of this you know, success in doing this numerically and experimentally, is that I don't need to do full state tomography. I don't need to reconstruct the full reduced density matrix to make a measurement of the entanglement entropy. All I need to do is come up with some method to calculate this thing right here, which looks like the purity, um, and I can do that via this, this swap operation. Okay, so let's try to do this in a few different cases um, and see, for example, what it would look like for, uh, for Rajibul's experiment. So Rajibul explained this in, in beautiful detail. I won't go into to too much other than to say, um, Essentially, they, they do the swap exactly on the system where they isolate two foresight of the system. They do this beam slitter operation, um, which is basically this, the swap. 
And then they, they separate, they do this measurement of the local parity that gives them access to the second Arrhenian entropy. And they find, as we did in our toy model of two particles on two sites, that the, the second Arrhenian entropy is large. In other words, the subsystem is more mixed in the superfluid phase and out here, um, statistically, there's no, di no difference between the top and the bottom. So we can do this swap um, on the computer and for different system sizes, we can see the exact same uh, value that they give, that they find, the only difference being that they have this vertical shift related to the entropy that's encoded in their optical lattice, and they're trying to reduce that entropy. Okay, so this is not nothing interesting other than, you know, th this curve that they, that Rajivul drew, drew right here is just the L equals four, one of these curves. But the more interesting thing then is to ask, well, what about this operational entanglement that now we can calculate because whenever we do this measurement, we can uh, determine how many particles there are in the subsystem. And so it turns out that if you do the operational entanglement on this system, um, the Foresight Bose Hubbard model that, uh, that Roger Bull studied, so that's the blue curves right here, you find that completely differently than the, uh, the spatial entanglement entropy, which is large in the superfluid phase and, and zero in this, this mod insulating phase, uh, it's basically very small out here. So there's not a lot of entanglement that could be extracted out of the system up here. So this is a, a Bose Hubbard model at, at unit filling. Um, but also in the superfluid phase, there's not a lot that can be extracted. And so the way to think about that is that all of this entanglement in the superfluid out here is just purely from number fluctuations, just particle fluctuations across the boundary are what's generating the entanglement. And it's not driven by interactions or you know, anything that is actually useful, that entanglement can't be swapped into a qubit to, do, to entangle a qubit from. And rather interestingly, what we see is that as we change the system size, so this is exact diagonalization results right here, as we change the system size from six up to 12, we see that we appear to see some scaling, um, and it might, the, this peak might be scaling towards the, the known location of this quantum phase transition. So maybe this operational entanglement, in addition to giving us information about how much entanglement is encoded in this, uh, can be extracted from the system, it could be a nice diagnostic for quantum phase transitions. Uh, we certainly don't have a, 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 any kind of scaling theory for this right now, but we're thinking about that. But then you have to look at this little 200 right here. So this peak is actually the operational entanglement multiplied by 200. And so in this particular system, this Bose-Hubbard model, the actual amount of extractable entanglement is really, really small compared to the amount of spatial entanglement. So at least for this system, this Foresight system, um, this is not gonna be a very good resource, right? The bosonic system for, for quantum information processing because this is just so small. But saying that, if you read this paper, there are methods by which you can do entanglement distillation, provided that there's any operational entanglement in a system, you can do distillation, and there is a procedure by which you could essentially increase the amount of usable entanglement in this. And we have a proposal in here for how you could do this in, in Rajabul's experiment or next generation thereof. Um, so peaks near the quantum phase transitions. Uh, you know, I, what I would really like to know is, is this really scaling towards the transition? But to answer that question, I would need to do something bigger than L equals 12. Maybe I can go push to L equals 16 or 20 with exact diagonalization, but I certainly can't go beyond that. And so we're limited to small systems and particular discrete Hilbert spaces, and I want to know if we can get bigger. I mean, we can do that. You saw this slide before with our path integral ground state uh, quantum Monte Carlo. So I won't read through all this again. These are the four answered questions. Description is itinerant particles in the spatial continuum. Um, configurations are these uh, the projected trial wave functions down to this central time slice where we have a good approximation to the ground state wave function. We can measure any conventional observable, and I'm gonna convince you we can measure this very unconventional swap observable as well. And our updates are just the jiggling around of the, the world lines. Okay, so what does the swap look like in this? Well, the swap is basically kind of simple, at least in principle. So now I have my system of world lines. So here I have imaginary time and here I have space. And I just make a copy of my system. So now I have two independent copies of the system. And then I break those two copies into the same subregions, whether they be particle entanglement, which would be based on world line number or spatial entanglement, which is what I've shown here. So this is region A, and this is region A prime, or sorry, A bar, and similarly down here. And then my swap says, I just need to swap the degrees of freedom. And so in the world line picture, all that means is that I start a world line in the bottom, and then at this central imaginary time slice where I actually make measurements, where I have the ground state wave function, I just swap into the other configuration. 
And so this is an instantaneous action that is like an estimator. I just ask, how likely is it that instead of this configuration, I'd have these cross configurations? So I just measure that as an expectation value. Of course, the simulation is double as hard as a regular one because I have two copies of the system. And actually, even worse, so this thing is really just the expectation value of the short, short imaginary time propagator that we learned in gory detail how to calculate on Tuesday. That's as easy as it is where we've just swapped these configurations. So in practice, really what we do is we just cut this link and then we add, we, we add a link right here and we just measure the short distance propagator, which is just some exponential, right, with some interactions. Um, it's just some Gaussian. But because this thing is, you know, could be potentially small, it has poor statistics and we need to work hard to make sure that we're getting the right answer. And as I said, this is technology that we adapted to the path integral language, um, but we're, you know, we're in no means trailblazers and many people had done this before in different flavors of Quantum Monte Carlo, and we just took it and figured out how we can stick it into this path integral language. And there's some subtleties that aren't in insulating lattice models because you can see that here, you know, this world line could actually move, the full world line could move from region A into A bar, and that's something that couldn't happen for a world line on a lattice. So one has to actually add moves that you know, sample an ensemble that includes uh, moving between the, the subregions for a full world line. All right, so. That's the algorithm. It, uh, it took us a while to get it going from, you know, it started with me drawing some world lines with cuts on a blackboard and then getting that in, into the code. And as I said, we want to make sure that it actually works. So we wanted to benchmark at the beginning on models that we know a lot about. And certainly my favorite model, kind of the, the icing model for uh, particles in the spatial continuum for me is the Liebliniger model, um, delta function interacting bosons with periodic boundary conditions. There's an exact solution. Uh, just because it's an exact solution doesn't mean that I can calculate correlation functions, but I know the wave function, so at least I could brute force integrate the wave functions to calculate the entanglement entropy for small system sizes. So I'm going to focus on both spatial entanglement and particle entanglement in this particular model. So here's my Hamiltonian and some reduced units. I just have a, a, a delta function interaction, um, and so I make a spatial cut. And so here's my region A, happens to have three particles, and here's my, my region A bar. All right, so basically, as I said, we were trying to test that this methodology of using the, the, the swap in pigs works. And so this is a, a plot of the entanglement entropy as a function, S2, the second Rainy entropy, as a function of the subsystem size um, for different values of the interaction strength. So in the Liebliniger model, there's a natural dimensionless quantity that's, that measures interaction strength. It's basically the strength of this delta function divided by the density of particles. So that's this gamma right here. You'll see that a couple times. And we can use the, the beta ansatz, which gives us the wave function generically, and we can brute force integrate that to compute what we expect the entanglement entropy to be for a spatial cut. That's the dashed line right here. This is two particles. Right? It's harder to do for more particles, but we can certainly do it for two. And we can run our quantum Monte Carlo and see that things work um, very, very nicely. But because of this fact that this swap estimator is basically exponentially suppressed, it, you know, we're actually measuring the exponential of the short dis or the expectation value of the short distance propagator. So once it gets big, that means that there's many particles, many swaps that I have to do for all particles in the subregion. And so there's various approaches. Uh, Roger talked about some of them. The so-called ratio trick is the one that seems to work the best for us. So this is showing, this is the, the sort of brute force way of, of doing for very large, well, eight particles. Um, we start to see huge statistical error bars, but if we do this, this ratio trick, which basically is a multi-ensemble method where we do some simulations with fixed swaps in them and then just measure a few additional um, ones and then compare the ratios of those system sizes, and there we can go up to essentially as many particles as we can handle on, on our supercomputers. So this works very well. And it's one of those things that after the fact, you, know, you do the brute force thing first. As I said, always do the stupid thing first. Um, and then you find when it doesn't work, then you can put it the hard thing in next. OK, so we can test because not only do we know for a small system size how to directly integrate this wave function, we know that this Lee Liniger model is, uh, you know, is a microscopic model that has this emergent um, gapless CFT, it's its descriptions at long wavelengths and low energies. It's just a Luttinger liquid. Uh, and there we know exactly for general alpha what the expected scaling should be, where we've talked a lot about this, uh, this central charge, which should be one in this particular case. And for a finite size system with periodic boundary conditions, instead of things scaling with L, it scales instead with this, uh, this so-called chord length, right? Because it has to be periodic. Um, with, the, with the periodic boundary conditions. So this is the prediction that comes from conformal field theory. There's even some very interesting so-called unusual corrections in this. 
So what we can do is we can measure the entanglement entropy as a function of this chord length uh, for different numbers of particles and compare with the various predictions. And so what we find is that for very small system sizes, so this thing is this L over uh, pi sine, it's just the chord length across this area right here. So if the system size or the subregion size is very, very small, then on average, there might only be one particle inside of it. And so it doesn't know about interactions at all. It, only, it doesn't even have a neighbor inside this subregion A. And you can probably can't see it. There's a dashed line that's going through these points for very small subregions. So that's just the prediction from free bosons. And the data essentially collapse exactly onto that. But then once we get to much, much larger subsystem sizes on the order of some finite fraction of the system size, when this thing should kick in, we find that we approach the, the CFT prediction. We, as I said, we can even characterize these additional constants. And we can extract a central charge from this, which is consistent with, uh, with the underlying field theory. So this, we think it works pretty well in, in the case where we know. We can also look at particle entanglement, where essentially there are no um, you know, ability to, to derive something exactly from the conformal field theory. But uh, Mazdul Hawk and, and, and Schutens predicted this sort of general scaling form for particle entanglement um, that's really just coming from some combination of interactions and, and uh, statistics. And so the, the prediction for the particle entanglement for essentially any, any system, um, this is some kind of empirical prediction, is that it should scale as the log of the binomial of n choose n. There's going to be some uh, constant out here and some, uh, some scaling corrections. And what we did is we said, OK, well, actually for small bipartitions, one or two particles, then this reduced density matrix is just the one or two body reduced density matrix. We know how to calculate that in certain situations. For example, in a bosonic Luttinger liquid, we know exactly what row one and row two look like. We can just integrate those directly. And when we do that, we find that we can actually even extract not only the form of the finite size corrections, but we know what this non-universal prefactor is. And it scales like the, si the size of the bipartition divided by the Luttinger parameter. And we can confirm that with Quantum Monte Carlo, where essentially what we do is, again, we know from beta ansatz in the sleeve Linager model how to calculate the Luttinger parameter. So for different bipartition sizes, we do the full scaling. We simulate a bunch of different system sizes and a bunch of different subsystem sizes. And we search for this form and extract this alpha. And we can get, as a function of interaction strength, all these different values of, of k. OK. So we think it works pretty well in, in these cases, and, and we're ready to move on. I and mean, we already learned, I think, some interesting things from this. This is certainly not the most efficient way if you want to extract the Luttinger parameter, um, but this is a nice confirmation. And so we've kind of learned the, 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 this is a summary of the sensitivity of particle entanglement or entanglement to statistics, that if I have a spatial bipartition, then the leading order scaling is basically universal. It only depends on this, this uh, central charge, but doesn't care about interaction strength and it doesn't care about particle symmetry for the, the case of spatial entanglement. But for a particle by partition, this leading order prefactor cares about statistics. So for fermions, it turns out it's universal. For bosons, it's this interaction dependent factor. Um, and we can learn a lot by studying these, these corrections as well. Well, so it, it doesn't depend, it doesn't, it, it doesn't scale with capital N, okay. right? So it only depends on the Rainy index and the size of the, and of course this, okay, there is an inherent assumption here that this little n is not a finite fraction of capital N. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Thank you. Yeah, for small little n, basically. You know, the, capital N and little n make sense as, as uh, terms when you're writing papers, but when you're giving talks, you just keep saying n, capital N, little n. They should have used two different values, two different names for these things. Okay, so let's get back to this, this area law. Now we kind of know that this is working. We can benchmark it in these exactly solvable models. Um, so we'd like to generically ask for a real quantum liquid. Can we see the area law, right? How does entanglement scale with the size of the, the subregion? Um, we know that generically for classical thermodynamic entropy, it's extensive. But for entanglement, there's, various, uh, there's a proof for gapped ground states in one dimension and, and ideas in higher dimensions. We believe that, that there should be such an entanglement area law. Uh, and this area law, as we've learned and seen in these holographic proofs, um, comes from uh, you know, the black hole thermodynamics. Um, and the, the first kind of connection to entanglement, this nice paper by, by uh, Shrednecki, um, a way to kind of simply understand the area model using just a harmonic oscillator type picture um, is that if I have some toy model where I have 
a bunch of, this is like Roger's picture of, of uh, the, the VB, the, the fluctuating valence bonds. Basically, I only have connections between my two subregions in such a model across the boundary. And so if I ask how entangled A is with A bar, then I can just count up the springs that cross this boundary and those scales with, with the perimeter and, and or the, you know, the, the area of this boundary and not the volume. So this is kind of a, a generic way to, to say how you might get this. Um, and while there's no proof for the area law above one dimension for gap ground states, there's sort of a nice general hand-waving derivation that I'll try to give you, and then you can attack me on all the various um, you know, holes in this argument. So I'll claim that one can derive the area law based on just two physical principles. The first is that the entangling entropy arises from correlations that are local to the entangling surface. Right? So that's just a kind of a, a, a statement about locality. So here's my generic system in D dimensions. I have some subregion, and I claim that all the entanglement only cares about the, the boundary. And of course, that might break down if I had long range interactions. But if, I, if it's driven, for example, by particle fluctuations, that's certainly true. And, and many of the in, you know, systems that we study have strong local interactions. So that's assumption number one. And assumption number two is that all length scales contribute. So this is sort of an, an RG argument that I need, to add, I need to sum up the contributions of the entanglement entropy local to the boundary from the microscopic all the way up to the macroscopic. And so this gives you a sense of where the gapped versus gapless comes in, because if I'm gapped, then I have some length scale that defines, right? So here I impose a length scale on the system. The microscopic length scale is, is inherent, um, but this macroscopic length scale could change either to the system size or to some local correlation length in a gap system. So the first part is this local contribution. So I claim that the local contribution to the entanglement entropy at scale little r, well, I just have some dimensionless um, measure of integration here. I have a surface element, and then I have any local quantity. So it just depends on the geometry of the surface. Um, let's say the curvature of, of this, this boundary right here. And then I wanna take this contribution and I wanna just integrate from the microscopic up to the macroscopic, all length scales contributing. So if I do that, and now let me assume um, that I have a spherical region. One could do this for any region. So I have a spherical region so that I expand this parameter G as just a, a Taylor series in the curvature. So I, this would be flat, right? This would be the, the first and, and second term. And because of the sphere, there's no odd powers. So how can one understand that there's no odd powers in this expansion? Well, we know that the entanglement of A with A bar is the same as A bar with A, right? And so I can't, if I had any odd powers in here, I would get minus signs when I, when I did that. So I know that the, I have to get this expansion. So now what I can do is I can just plug this G and use this formula and integrate. So that's all I'm doing here. I'm plugging, so here's my, in, uh, I'm, speci I'm specifying to three dimensions here. Um, so I plug this thing in here, then I plug this expression in right here, do the integration, and immediately what you'll see is an area law pops out. So this derivation, as hand-waving as it might be, basically tells you that I should expect an area law for, for any system here um, from integrating from the, the microscopic to the, the macroscopic. And there are corrections. There's a log correction, there's constant corrections. And it turns out that these corrections, as various people have said this week, are often much more interesting than this dominant area loss. Right? This C naught is generically non-universal, but there could be some interesting universal information that shows up down here. All right, so in the last sort of five minutes, let me tell you about how we confirmed this result um, in, in my favorite quantum phase of matter, which is superfluid helium-4. It has this fountain effect. Here's the phase diagram we already talked about. And we can simulate it very accurately with quantum Monte Carlo. So this is the lambda transition, the superfluid transition. The green line is an experiment, and the uh, the points here are, are simulations that were done by an undergraduate in my group on his laptop in a couple of hours. So that's pretty amazing that these simulations are basically limited by how well we know the interaction potential between two helium atoms. And if you're willing to work really hard we, you know, and, and program it up, we do know it to even higher accuracy than this. So what are we going to do? So we're going to take a 3D box with periodic boundary conditions at zero temperature and we're gonna put it at saturated vapor pressure. We, could change, we can freely change the density, but I'm just gonna do SVP for now. Here's my many-body Hamiltonian. In this case, there's no confining potential. I just have periodic boundary conditions. And we learned last time that this interaction is just sort of Van der Waals-like at long distances. It looks like Leonard Jones, right? So here's the dipole-dipole interactions. Here's the hard core of the helium atom. And there's some minimum here that's about minus 10 Kelvin. So I'm gonna take this system and I'm gonna do run my path under Monte Carlo with the swap, and I'm gonna measure the entanglement between a sphere of radius r inside the center of my box and the rest, 
and then I'm going to change the size of the sphere. Right? So I'm going to do finite size scaling in different ways. One way is I can keep the box size fixed, but keep changing the size of the sphere. But you can probably imagine that that's going to lead to some strong finite size effects because once I get to the, the you know, this approaches the size of the system, then this is a weird kind of just boxes of the corner that are showing up because of periodic boundary conditions. Actually, when I showed this, and I gave this talk, someone that, that did molecular dynamic simulations told me that I was really stupid and that there are you know, types of periodic boundary conditions that use rhombohedral cells that would have been much better for this. And so we're actually working on that now, how we can get a you know, better simulation cell than this circle inside a box, circle inside a square, I admit. Um, but one can do better. Um, the other thing you could do is you could keep this, you know, the, the relative size fix and scale them both at the same time. And so we can do both of those things. And you can see all the details in, in here. And these are, the, these are the brute force results. So again, these are different box sizes, which corresponds to different particle numbers at, uh, at saturated vapor pressure um, as we change the size. And so as I told you, as for a given system size, as we approach the largest sphere that can fit inside the box, we start to see some strong finite size effects. But what's amazing is that essentially for the small box sizes, all of these, you know, where they overlap, they all kind of scale perfectly. There's no scaling. This is the raw data right here with error bars. And we can ask the same questions we asked before. The first is this question, well, if the, if the size of the sphere is very, very small, then it's likely that on average there might only be one particle inside the sphere. And then it doesn't even know about interactions. It's purely just fluctuations. It's just like a BEC. And so at very, very small r, we recover the prediction that you would get from just free bosons. So that was a nice confirmation. And then we can say, well, how is this thing scaling with r? If the area law is indeed correct, we should expect that it should scale like r squared. And so one can plot some r squared, the, the surface area of the sphere, and it basically goes through all of this data. But you could argue that you know, one, you know, one can try to fit this r squared, but there might be other things that are showing up. You could ask, is there a volume law? Right? Maybe there is some volume. We know there's subleading corrections, which we'd like to study the log and the constants and so on. Um, but we can look for the simplest type of fit which would either be volume law with two fit parameters, this non-universal A, um, and uh, this, this interparticle separation we actually know quite well from the, the details of the interaction potential. And so we can actually come up with a, a, a residual um, between the Monte Carlo data and these fit parameters for the, the same number of fit parameters, where here is the zero of this residual, and indeed we see that the volume law is just not consistent. It's statistically you know, uh, many sigma outside, especially for these, these small and large, of the area law. So this is kind of statistical, statistical proof within our data set that we've been able to see um, this area law. So it's definitely area law, not volume law. And of course, now there's many things that we'd love to do. So now that we know there's an area law and we can do these fits, we'd like to pull out that area law and search for those additional corrections, the log and, and whatnot. These are related to um, tower of states corrections. There's some universal numbers in there. Uh, we'd like to get access to all those. We need to move to a little bit larger system sizes to be able to see that. Or you can see my R here is going from, let's say, two to six. This is a three-dimensional system. This is, it's a hard simulation to do. This is not a large length scale over which one could search for a log. Um, we're working on, on various ways of doing that. Okay, so hopefully I've kind of convinced you of two things. The first is that uh, if you have itinerant indistinguishable particles, there are different types of bipartitions that you could do, spatial, particle, different modes, and they might give you complementary useful information. And that information can be used both to, to study the underlying types of phases, particle statistics and interactions, but also ask questions about how useful would a resource made out of those degrees of freedoms be for quantum information processing? How much could be transferred to a register? Uh, and the other part was after you know, developing this QMC method um, to measure the entanglement entropy, we could actually use it on a real state of matter. This is basically an ab initio simulation. As I said, we can get experimental quantities um, to a couple decimal places and we used it to study this area law, the entanglement area law in, in this helium-4, um, and it has some connections, as we said, to the, the same area law that, that we've heard about all week. All right, so as usual, if you're interested in the actual code that does this, uh, you can look at it on here. Um, and for the most part, some of these simulations were, took you know, many millions and millions of, of CPU hours, and so for that, we have um, the great senator from the state of Vermont to thank, who back in the days of earmarks, um, gave us a lot of money to build uh, our supercomputing center in Vermont. So 
Um, thanks to Senator Leahy for that. And thanks for listening. If you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yep. So that's the ratio trick. So we basically, yeah, so we're working this extended ensemble where you force a bunch of them and then you try to add one more, let's say, or two more to that ensemble already. And then you can do essentially like something like umbrella sampling. But ultimately, you want to scale that system size, right? And so you want to build up. So once I make the, the subregion size a little bit bigger, I want to be able to use the information I've already gained from the smaller, having done the smaller simulation. Because every time I do this, I have to do a completely different simulation, basically. Yeah. But the, I mean, there certainly are ways, that you're right, that you could put everything in the ensemble. Um, and that's another approach to doing this, yeah. Yep, sure. As I said, I'm, it's a bit hand wavy. Did you make an assumption of how the contribution to the entanglement behaves as you go away from the circuit? I guess I'm. No, so the only, so I've made an assumption here that it only depends, well, so it's a very strong assumption of how it decays. Right, I'm saying that there's, there's only a local quantity here, and that local quantity only depends on the shape of the surface. So it's, it's purely. Oh, so this is so this is just because I have so this is the full surface element here. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's a very strong assumption that it's purely local. But then, of course, for the second line, you are assuming that every scale contributes equal. That's correct. Yeah. So within these assumptions, one can derive it. You can also, I mean, you can also see that you would get the the CFT prediction from this as well, um, because in one dimension you would get the log. Uh, and this has been, this is certainly not due to me. This argument has been presented in the literature various times, but I think it's, you, know, you, can, you can immediately see, for example, if you had a slab instead of a sphere where you, you know, could allow odd terms, then you could basically have a linear term that shows up in here. Um, so you can get a lot of useful information out of such an argument. And then you can go and check whether these, you know, how accurate this is. Yep. Yeah, so if you have an MPS, that's basically just a different way. I mean, there you essentially would get this for free, or maybe you'd encode the entanglement into your MPS already. Um, so the, the, the tier, the trial wave function, so you, what, you, is what you're asking is, is the projected trial wave function that we get in pigs, could that be useful for MPS? So I think that the continuum space MPS is pretty, still sort of in its infancy. Um, right, so the difference here is that there is no, there's no spatial lattice. So here there's no lattice for these simulations. Yeah, it's a, so it's a spatial continuum, yeah. I mean, one of the nice things about working in the continuum, of course, is on a lattice, you would have to have some registration of this sphere to your lattice, right? In the continuum, you're free to have any shape that you want, because this is just defined in software. If I had a lattice, I would have to interpolate between lattice sites. I'd have to you know, basically speckle my sphere on top of the, on top of the lattice. So, you know, naively that might tell you, well, there's lots of interesting things. You could look at different shapes, multiply connected regions. But in practice, one of the limitations is that in the continuum, it's difficult to address um, kind of interesting quantum critical points uh, because you don't have local constraints to engineer different phases, basically. You always have essentially two particle or maybe three particle interactions. Um, you know, the, the set of, of quantum critical points that you can look at are maybe limited. No free lunch. 